a student. Hello, welcome to the afternoon session today. We have Dr. Trudy and she is, Trudy Hugenboom is a planetary scientist and planetary science teacher with a PhD in planetary geophysics from the University of Leeds. Dr. Trudy has worked as a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and the Arctic Planetary Science Institute. She co-authored the first topographic map of Io, which is a moon in the outer solar system, the first geographic, geological map of For Vesta, and sits on various NASA proposal funding panels. She co-founded MV Academy with Dr. Jim Green and Wasim Ahmed, teaching space sciences to students in virtual reality classrooms orbiting Mars. She also joined Ad Astra and Astronova, the school founded by Elon Musk and Josh Don at SpaceX, teaching learners around the world to use professional grade astrophysical software to find main belt asteroids, create peer review publishable research projects, including AI detection of craters on the moon, glacier mapping on Mars, and various cave identification and Ganymede, another moon of the outer solar system, related projects. Her Astronova asteroid search team students locate previously unidentified asteroids and are listed with NASA's Minor Planet Center as the discoverer and granted naming rights. Today, Dr. Hugenboom will be will be speaking on microgravity and the effects on the human body. You if you do you need to share your screen? Yep, I can share my screen. Easy Let peasy. Me. Give the screen. You have the floor. Find it. Thanks, Nicole. Um, you guys can call me uh, Trudy or Dr. Trudy Keller. You must have heard this a million times. Um, but I, um, I pretty much all my students call me Trudy or Dr. Trudy. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about explaining the effects on the human body um, from something uh, known as microgravity. Um, Nicole, what? How do you normally run these? Would you like? Um, are they able to ask questions as they go? Do you want them to hold? questions to the end they can put the questions in the chat and okay. then unmute at the end after your talk excellent okay great all right so definitely write your questions in chat um, and then we'll get to every one of them afterwards um, gravity is one of the most fundamental forces in the universe um, and the acceleration due to gravity near the earth's surface is nine near the earth's surface is 9.8 meters per second squared and we generally call this 1g um, when you're in high school and this, this happened to me i was it took me a really long time when you're in high school um, taking high school physics you get taught that the gravity on the earth is 9.8 meters per second and the gravity on the earth on mars is you know roughly a third um, of Earth's, um, but actually the uh, the gravity uh, across any planet, including Earth, Mars, wherever, varies depending on where you are, and it varies depending on you know the rocks that you are standing on. But generally, the Earth's surface is the uh, the acceleration. Um, uh, on the Earth's surface is 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, and so this is one of these classic high school formulas that you will cover in physics, and that is F equals G M1 M2 on R squared, um, which allows you to calculate the gravitational force um, on different objects. Uh, and obviously that works in planetary science. So microgravity um, comes about when any object is in free fall. And microgravity uh, is just like the word uh, on, this, on the screen says, micro meaning little, um, and gravity is so very small um, amounts of gravity. And so the fast, that is like, if you have an object in free fall, um, that object will fall faster and fa faster accelerating with, you know, exactly the acceleration due to gravity. Um, 1G is what we say on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, so as soon as you drop something, it is in a state of free fall. So if I drop this pen and it, uh, it falls, uh, it's in a state of free fall. Um, and so life on Earth has developed in this 1G environment. Everything in around you, your cat, your dog, trees, plants, cows, uh, any, um, anything on the Earth has developed 
in 1G gravity. Our bodies are the shape that they are um, because uh, we have grown up in you know 1G or 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration on us at all times. Um, and so everything that you know, the apple that you eat, any food that you're eating, plants, animals, trees, everything, um, everything on the earth has evolved over billions of years to be what they are today, but they've all been in one gravitational environment. They're all in 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, and so the reliance on the human uh, body on gravity is clearly seen when gravity is removed. Um, and so you must have seen, you've likely seen on uh, the International Space Station or when you ever see uh, science fiction movies and you have people floating around in space, uh, this is this has tremendous implications for our genetics um, and for our body uh, in general. And so there's a lot of research and science that is done uh, based entirely on uh, how gravity affects our bodies. Um, and you'll see a lot of 1990s, uh, early 2000s astronaut photos in this presentation, but uh, what I want you to understand is, uh, so the, here we have a photo of an astronaut, you know, floating in space, once in orbit, spacecraft and space stations are essentially microgravity environments. Um, and these space stations, like the International Space Station um, and the space stations that Blue Origin is building, Orbital Reef uh, and other private space companies around the world will be in the same situation. Those objects are essentially falling around the Earth. And while they're doing that and they're orbiting around the Earth, these astronauts are experiencing weightlessness. And so when we look at them, it looks like it looks like a person that's just free floating uh, in air. But this particular astronaut and every astronaut, dog, cat, uh, animal, plant that is uh, in microgravity or orbiting around um, around, uh, you know, the Earth or Mars, etc., experiences, uh, you know, the effects of this microgravity on their bodies. Um, NASA uses a variety of facilities to create microgravity conditions. If you are ever at Johnson Space Center um, and you uh, know you're going to be there a couple of weeks in advance, um, there's a special kind of VIP tour that you can, anybody, you don't need to be a scientist, anybody can join. Um, and they will take you to the diving facilities. And so one of the main facilities that, that NASA uses to, to create microgravity um, is uh, in diving tanks. Uh, and also probably the most famous one that you, you may have already heard of is called the Vomit Comet. Um, and the Vomit Comet is a C9 low G, low gravity flight research aircraft that takes off just like a regular aircraft, just like if you were flying from Seattle to Los Angeles, takes off as a regular aircraft, goes up into a parabolic arc. Um, and so it goes up, 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 up. And then at the very, then it turns around and goes down, 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 down. So at the very top of that, uh, of that path, um, these human bodies that are floating around in this aircraft um, are in uh, microgravity for 20 to 25 seconds. And so they float around and you'll see lots of photos. If you type in microgravity, you know, people or humans um, into Google, you'll see lots of photos of, of people doing that. Um, I think you, I've, I'm pretty sure that people are paid to go on the Vomit Comet. It's literally an aeroplane, like a regular, you know, aeroplane. There's nothing super fancy. It doesn't look like um, Virgin Galactic's uh, tourism plane. It looks like a, a regular, you know, aeroplane that's had all the seats, most of the seats removed, um, and people, uh, you know, go up um, uh, uh, to experience microgravity. It's called the Vomit Comet for a reason, and that is that microgravity, humans uh, aren't used to it. So when we're suddenly floating in space, people tend to vomit. Um, it's not called the vomit comet for, you know, it's called, it's called the vomit comet for a reason. Um, before you fly on this spacecraft, they do offer you um, uh, anti-nausea meds. Uh, some people are completely fine the first time they go up. Some people, it takes a really long time. Um, I'm definitely the kind of person that would probably would vomit. Um, so this is one of the ways that we, we do it. And so this is an example. Here's what the vomit comet looks like. Here's a bunch of people. You can see it 
it's like a regular airplane that you would travel on to go to Disneyland or see your friends and family um, and it's uh, padded and the reason why it's padded is because these are just regular humans they're not astronauts that have gone through astronaut training um, and so they tend to bump into things and so it's all padded um, for their safety um, and so 25 seconds right so if this if we if we if this vomit comet or this airplane can get you know 20 to 25 seconds of microgravity that's not a lot of time um, for the amount of you know research that we need to do to be able to uh, understand the effects of microgravity so it's a really good start 20 to 25 seconds of microgravity is better than nothing um, but the other way that we do it is uh, in these giant flotation tanks. If you get a chance, go to, Je to Johnson Space Center in Houston. This is an amazing thing to see. Um, and they have astronauts uh, training underneath the water. And the reason why they travel there underwater um, is not because they plan on swimming in uh, oceans on uh, Europa or Enceladus. Uh, it's because the, we want to simulate these microgravity uh, environments. And so this is it's a really cool thing to, to see. So the astronauts um, in, are in their training. You can actually go see them do it um, on tourism tours. Um, and they do have safety divers uh, in there to make sure that, you know, everybody is safe. Um, here's some examples of some safety dry, divers. Um, my friend Jim Green has actually done this, you know, uh, earlier in his career, uh, was a safety diver helping these astronauts um, prepare for missions uh, on the International Space Station. Um, and so they get to feel what it's like in, um, in these sorts of, uh, uh, of um, gravity conditions. Um, so humans in gravity, this is a super scary photo. I apologize. I did grab this off the, of the web. It's not the greatest um, image of a human floating in space, but um, the, main, the main effects, so there's a lot of different effects. We talked about how microgravity effects um, can make people nauseous um, and vomit. But one of the biggest issues that we have for uh, transporting people from the earth to Mars or actually living on Mars is that in the absence of gravity, the gravity that we have all evolved and grown up, um, you know, used to, in the absence of this gravity, the muscles in the leg and back, legs and, uh, and our uh, back around our spine tend to um, weaken and they uh, atrophy. Um, and the reason why they atrophy is they're no longer required to support the weight of astronauts. So you and I, sitting here listening to this class um, I'm sitting down on a chair um, and I'm not working out right I'm not you know working on a treadmill and I'm not running or anything but my body is um, holding my body upright so the muscles in my spine are holding my body upright and so they're getting a little bit of a workout all day every day just doing the regular things that you do like walking around and you know going to school or playing with a playground or whatever you're doing um, but in the absence of regular gravity when you're in microgravity so experience only a very small fraction of 9.8 meters per second squared pulling you down onto the earth at all times um, we become uh, our, bad things happen to our muscles um, and also to our bones um, because every day we're sitting here even when you're asleep your muscles are still working your heart's still working etc cetera, etc cetera. so when you're in microgravity um, there's some real issues and so on this figure here and I, I think these are recorded and I'll also give these slides to um, Nicole um, uh, there's a bunch of things so touch and pressure sensors register no downward force and so for instance if you are um, your feet are not registering pressure um, yeah, we have fluid distribution uh, throughout our limbs. Um, the way that our kidneys are, uh, function is completely different in microgravity than it is in regular gravity. So um, not only do we have uh, create bone loss, but you also increase the chances for kidney stones. And if you've ever had a kidney stone, it's really not pleasant. And it's something that would be very, very difficult to uh, take care of on a long flight from the Earth to Mars, uh, whilst being on Mars or on the way back. Um, you know, if you get a kidney stone uh, and you can't pass it by yourself, it does require medical intervention. Um, there's a bunch of other issues that we're going to talk about that affect the body. 
uh, in microgravity. And, and one of those is um, uh, as uh, radiation, high, uh, higher radiation doses increase our, um, increase our cancer risk. Um, but we're going to talk all about those. Um, and here is a zoomed in. It is a really creepy figure. If you can, you can Google this. I grabbed this from the web. Um, but weight deteriorate, weight bearing bones and muscles deteriorate. So not so much the bones in your fingers, um, but your larger bones, like your femur, your leg bones, your arm bones, um, and the muscles, you know, that are uh, supporting them all deteriorate. Uh, and we have, this is, this is not something that we just think happens. We have a lot of scientific evidence uh, for this happening. And one of the ways that we can do this is to study the astronauts' bodies while they're on Earth. Um, and we take, uh, for instance, blood samples, x-rays, MRI, CTs um, of astronauts. Um, and these astronauts, you know, volunteer to do this, right? It's, it's scientific research. Uh, we take a bunch of information about their bodies um, before space and then after space, and then we, they track it, you know, months and years afterwards. And so this is not something that we just think might happen. This is something that we have a lot of data about. Um, one of the most interesting things to me, which is I, the, the muscles make sense to me. I, it's always kind of been very intuitive that if your bones and muscles aren't, you know, aren't working in the same uh, environment that they would change. Um, but uh, fluid congestion uh, causes head congestion and puppy, puffy faces. And so what's really interesting to me is this is a very old, this is a, um, uh, uh, probably 20 years old photo, um, but you can see astronaut photo here before flight and astronaut after, um, you know, during flight. And you can see that this um, astronaut's, you know, face has become puffy. Um, and I think that's one of the most interesting things that for me, I was really amazed by that just by putting a human being into the International Space Station um, for a couple of weeks um, would change the face shape of a human. So you can imagine how much your bodies would change um, you know, if we were humans that were living on Mars, that hopefully we um, we are, uh, you know, in the very near future. Um, and so when exposed to microgravity, humans experience side effects. And so this headward fluid shift or puffy face is the first kind of, you know, effect that's, you know, noticed in the absence of gravity where you have bloody, mo the, the blood moves from, you know, the lower body to the head, right? When normally when we're walking around the earth, um, our blood is pulled downwards. Um, but if we're in the effects of microgravity, it's not. And so um, our heads get puffy. But what's, what's even more interesting to, to me is you may have a puffy face, um, but that also implicates if you have a bunch of um, uh, fluid uh, in your um, you know, head area, um, it does affect your taste, your sense of taste as well. And so these astronauts you know, report you know, different um, that their taste has changed. And this is only because of microgravity. It's not because they're, you know, in space and they've suddenly decided that they don't like tomatoes or they do like tomatoes. It's because of this physical reaction. The microgravity is not pulling, um, you know, blood down towards, you know, downwards because they're just floating in, uh, in space. And so all of this fluid can actually change a human's face and change their taste. Um, fluid re redistribution shrinks the legs. Uh, and we have come up with a bunch of different ways to, to fix this. So despite the fact that we know that there is a lot of microgravity effects, um, scientists work on this all the time. There are, this is a, gen a genuine career path that any one of you can go into. Uh, it's a career path that's experienced a lot um, of growth and funding in the last, you know, especially 20 years. Um, but because of this research and scientific research and astronauts, um, we now know that the best way to counteract the effects of, mount of gravity on th that one particular thing, bone loss and muscle loss, is exercise. And so when you see these, these photos of these astronauts exercising in, uh, in the space station, it's not just because they're healthy people that just love exercise, they're doing it to uh, preserve their bodies um, and to keep their muscles strong and their bones strong. Um, if our kidneys don't function correctly, uh, in microgravity, which we know they don't, then uh, our kidneys are not able to uh, process this calcium. And so this is a, a figure A is a, um, is 
what uh, uh, your bones look like under microscopes um, uh, before uh, travel and figure B is what happens after space travel. And so you notice that there's a lot of little holes here um, in our spinal. This works, for, this is a picture of the spine, obviously, but this is works for any bone in our body that if there's a lot of gaps. And so the, pro the problem is that if we are losing bone mass and we're losing calcium from our bones, it's traveling through our bloodstream and possibly causing kidney stones. But worse still, structurally, figure B is a bad idea. Okay, they are more open to bones being broken through very, you know, uh, average activities. Um, and so the great thing about, about NASA and space travel uh, and space research is that the stuff that we learn whilst we're trying to counteract the effects of gravity um, or, uh, on Mars or around the moon or whatever we're doing is useful for back on Earth. And it works this, the, the reverse way too. Osteoporosis is a condition where, um, uh, where human beings uh, experience bone loss just through uh, the aging process. Um, and so there are medicines um, that have been developed over the last, you know, 50 something years that combat osteoporosis. And so that's another thing that we use to keep astronauts safe. Any one of you that will travel to Mars, um, hopefully in your lifetimes, this is the kind of things you'll be doing. You will be until we uh, invent a gravity machine. Um, while we're, uh, or a better or faster way to get to Mars, you as an astronaut will be exercising to maintain your bones and muscles, and you'll also be taking um, osteoporosis, you know, medications to maintain your bone strength and your calcium strength. Um, this microgravity just causes a rapid loss of bone density. And so this is what a normal bone looks like under um, microscopy. And this is bone um, with osteoporosis. And so the, the current you know, understanding is that um, gravity plays a role in the generation of the home hormones that, you know, that in our bodies are responsible for, for bone growth. And so uh, there are ways around this. This is one of the things that we've made a lot of uh, what's the word, a lot of progress with in the last, you know, 50 years or especially 30 years of space exploration. Um, but these are things that we need to do because the last thing we want to do is put a bunch of science, a bunch of astronauts up onto the moon um, and then have them return to the moon and, you know, have real issues uh, going forward. Um, and so this, micro, this science of microgravity is actually really fascinating too. Uh, a lot of pharmaceutical uh, drug manufacturers um, are able to use microgravity to test medications and, and drugs uh, in a different environment. And so there's a lot of things like that. I would encourage you all to compete in the Genes in Space competition uh, next year. It's another one of these um, great science competitions where you can choose kind of basically any topic you like and learn more about uh, the effects of gravity in space. Um, and you can do that just by Googling genes in space. Um, and so we, uh, we, use this, we use this microgravity environment on the International Space Station uh, to do scientific research. Um, so it has a lot of effects on the brain too. These dudes look like, um, look like bats, right? They look like bats hanging upside down. Um, but the effect of space environment on the brain and nervous systems, really important area of study. We said before that uh, some people, when they're on the vomit comet or experiencing microgravity, it's very common uh, for astronauts arriving onto the International Space Station um, that they feel nausea. And the reason why they feel no nausea is because their brain is not sure where they are in space and time. Uh, and if your brain doesn't know where you are, you tend to feel nauseous. It's, it's the same uh, effect that people experience um, if you're someone that gets car sick, like I am. Um, if you're not paying attention to where you are in space and time and you're feeling kind of, uh, your brain doesn't know exactly where you are, then you, you do have that nauseous feeling. And so figuring out how the space, uh, how space and lack of gravity works on our brains and affects our brains is really important. 
Um, it also has a large effect on the biological clock and sleeping, sleeping patterns of astronauts. You as high school students maybe sleep, what, 9 p.m. till 7 a.m. Uh, and so generally people have a, you know, settle in as humans, we settle into our own sleep patterns, whatever our circadian rhythms are. Um, I'm one of these people that likes to go to sleep really, really early. Um, but whatever that is, uh, when these astronauts, they may have this, this general sleeping pattern that they sleep for, um, you know, from 9 p.m. till 6 a.m. or something like that. Uh, but in space, it's very, very different. And so when they're in the International Space Station or if they're traveling in a spacecraft to Mars, uh, their, uh, their circadian rhythms are um, messed up. And if you've ever been super tired before, you will notice that as a super tired person, you won't make the same logical decisions and so the tireder that you are the worse um you know kind of cognitive decisions that you're making which is not a good situation to be in if you are in a tin can or if you're in a floating around in a, on a space station um away from you know other uh, support so understanding how microgravity affects the brain is a really important um important thing to know Space travel, microgravity changes your sensory input. You're not standing on the ground. You're not feeling your feet walk along the ground. Um, and this kind of messes with your brain. And so in general, our bodies uh, and our brains sense uh, smell, sound, taste. Um, we, uh, we can see where we are uh, and we can sense temperature, right? We know when something's hot and something's cold. Space and microgravity affects that. Um, sometimes you'll see science fiction movies and I am a huge monster science fiction movie uh, fan. I love science fiction. Um, it's my favorite thing to read. It's my favorite thing to watch. Uh, and science fiction has done so, so many amazing things for technology. Um, you know, the invention of cell phones, all of these kind of things. Um, but what's really important, I think, is being able to, um, when you're watching these movies, sometimes you'll be like, oh, like on Star Trek, right? They've somehow invented uh, a um, gravity device or an anti-gravity device. And so Captain Picard is just walking around normally. Um, we are not at the point where our technology is at that point. Uh, we are still floating around in space. Um, and so figuring out how this affects our nervous system, vestibular system, everything else is really important. Um, the human vestibular system maintains balance. Uh, as does canines, cats, dogs, cows, whatever it is. Um, our vestibular systems maintain balance by sending information to the brain about where we are, it, where our position is in, in relation to environment and how we're moving. And it does that by essentially sensing gravity. Um, during microgravity, the vestibular system gets super confused, right? There's no feet pressing down on a surface. You may be floating around the International Space Station and pushing off from certain things, um, but it's very disorientating. Um, and it gets to the point where as an astronaut, they are only the main sense that they're able to rely on is their vis visual sensory input. And they use that for, you know, that's the thing that they tend to rely on. Um, space motion sickness is experienced by more than 50% of, of, of all astronauts during their first few days um, of exposure to microgravity. It results in vomiting, nausea. Um, as you can imagine, that's detrimental to crew performance. If you are an astronaut and you are sent up to the space station to perform X, Y, and Z experiments or tasks, and you are vomiting and sick, um, that's really hard to deal with. Um, and it's also it's something that you've noticed if you've ever uh, gone on a on a ship and that ship is going up and down in on large waves, it's very similar, uh, a very similar feeling and a very similar response to that your body feels. And so if you've ever been nauseous in a car or vomiting, um, you can imagine that that's not pleasant. It's super not pleasant in microgravity because one, that vomit's just going everywhere. Um, uh, if you do not put it in a bag very, very fast. Um, and so these are, these are things that, that all astronauts will need to um, deal with. Um, these spacecraft environments tend to be quite clinical. This is an older image, but they still look a lot like this, um, where they have these essentially laptops, uh, you know, zip tied to the wall, it even looks like. A spacecraft or any space station has to provide a pressurized environment for humans. We rely on fresh uh, drinking water, food, safe air. Um, 
these environments are constantly mon monitored to avoid microbial contamination um, uh, and you know to basically make sure that your astronauts immune system is functioning uh, as you know as it should one of the most i think the most common things that people think about when uh, talking about you know issues with space travel is radiation um, these astronauts are exposed to ionizing radiation from the sun. They're above um, the thicker parts of the Earth's atmosphere, obviously, that is protecting you and me while we're sitting or running around outside. Um, but these things can, these, uh, these radiation effects can uh, generally, we categorize them into acute and, and long term. In general, small amounts of radiation are not, not detrimental. Uh, but if you're in a spacecraft and you are, not and you're exposed to this uh, uh, radiation on a day-to-day -day basis that has long-term effects for your for your body and that is something that um, that we definitely want to avoid um, these acute effects of radiation are, are that are immediately seen a nausea vomiting skin red skin skin reddening and dehydration and so this nausea and vomiting um, is not caused by the microgravity um, it's caused by uh, radio, radiation exposure, uh, you know, doing detrimental things to your um, uh, di digestive system. Um, only moderate doses of radiation are encountered. Um, in general, spacecrafts, uh, we do make them as radiation proof um, as we can without massively uh, incurring too much mass for our spacecraft, but it's something that, that we really do need to pay attention to. And it's something that is really important for, um, you know, any Mars mission going forward, especially while you are figuring out um, how to protect your astronauts um, on the ground uh, on Mars. And so the long-term effects of radiation are much more dangerous to astronauts um, the passage of, of charged particles through a cell um, can cause ionization and cause damages, it damages our DNA. And so um, most dangerous is the non-lethal mutation of DNA, which essentially um, can lead to cancer over long term. So it's, it's one thing that you need to be paying attention to while you are um, uh, working in your groups, how you are going to protect your, um, your uh, astronauts. Um, human spaceflights moving from relatively short-term missions. We, uh, uh, the Apollo astronauts, we have uh, astronauts that have orbited around the um, around the Moon, around Earth. Uh, we are sending the Artemis. NASA's got Artemis mission is well underway through Artemis phase two, three, and four coming up. Um, but in the future, we want like long term trips, right? We have long, we need to solve these problems of long duration spaceflight. Um, any mission to Mars, depending on when on your launch schedules and your launch times is going to take a lot longer than just going to the moon. Uh, and the ideal, uh, ideal plan is that if we are able to send humans to Mars, then, then we could have them living on Mars for a little while and come back. And so this is of the, you know, of the order of years, one year, three year trips uh, that these astronauts need to survive. Uh, and thrive. And to do that, we need to really uh, fully understand the effects of um, all of these things uh, that happen to astronauts during spaceflight. Um, not just the psychological issues of living in a small tin can, essentially, uh, with only a certain number of people to hang out with, um, but also be able to understand the effects, be able to fully get rid of the effects of uh, bone loss, um, uh, damage to our vestibular system, long-term damage to our DNA, uh, to name um, a few. What's interesting to me and what I find really fascinating is that eventually we will land on Mars. Um, I really, I'm a big, I'm a huge fan of uh, the idea of people landing on Mars and people living on the moon and uh, on Mars, but any human beings that end up living on Mars for a long, long time, their body structure will change. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because the gravity on, on Mars is roughly a third of what it is on the Earth. And so you would expect that if just assuming that we are able to solve these large, um, you know, problems of keeping astronauts safe, 
uh, on a place that is generally inhospitable, um, their bodies will lengthen. They have less gravity pulling them down. So um, there are some fascinating studies right now about the long-term effects of living in low gravity um, that um, I encourage you to look into if you're, if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, studying plants and animals is really important to um, being able to understand how plants and animals are affected by microgravity is, is really important. It's just something that has been done uh, not so much with animals, you know, in the very recent times, but definitely, um, you know, uh, further back. Um, but being able to understand the biological effects of microgravity on plants, on a plant that is growing um, on the space station is, is fascinating. I know that you guys have had have lectures about that. Um, if you uh, find yourself bored on your summer holidays, go look up the veggie uh, experiment that is going on on the space station right now. It's, it's really fascinating. If you have a plant that is growing in microgravity and doesn't know where to grow the roots down because there's no gravity acting on it, these are, these are fascinating scientific, um, uh, scientific um, problems that need to be solved. Um, every one of you has the potential to go on and do something like this. Um, uh, so I just, I think that this is really, really fascinating. Okay, um, I would love to have questions. Um, normally my classes, people ask questions when they go through. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing and I would love for you to, um, to ask questions. Um, there's some in chat, let's see. Do you want um, me to read them for you? Um, there's a lot. Uh, okay. The, uh, jo, uh, yeah. You, do you want to read that? There's one from Dave, David. David says, what if the astronauts wear a more heavy suit around the legs and back while they are on the space station or they wear weights around legs and the back? Would that help with something? David, you're doing something awesome right now and you're doing the exact same thing that every scientist does when, you know, when they're first proposed, like um, first confronted with a problem like that, which is like, oh, we know that there's biological effects on this human body. Um, what can we do? And this is exactly what these people do. We sit around in a group um, these days, it's on Zoom, um, but, and talk about like, oh, what could that be and what could we do? But that's uh, weight bearing exercise is what um, uh, these astronauts actually do. Um, you were suggesting something that, that we um, definitely already do on the International Space Station um, and we'll do more of. So yeah, you, you're, you're suggesting weight bearing exercise, wearing weights around your back and your, uh, on your legs and lower, um, uh, yes, would help, would it save or does it solve the problem completely? No, um, but it's definitely the right way forward, right? So they have these, um, these astronauts, you know, running on a treadmill, et cetera, et cetera. They're weighted down. Um, uh, but that's a really good, that's a really good um, point. This is exactly what you do. Um, the same thing happened when the Pluto data came back from the New Horizons mission and the, the New Horizons science team got together as these images are coming back and they're like, wait, how does that happen? How does that happen? And then we come, come up with ideas um, and go through the scientific process of, okay, that doesn't fit, that does fit. Um, so yeah, what you're doing is really great. Um, there is another one from James Mitchell. James would like to know, do space missions bring astronauts who are also medically knowledgeable? Oh, James, that's such a good question. Back in my day, um, this is, yes, I love you. Back in my day, um, medically uh, knowledgeable, yes. So it used to be like, if you look at the Apollo astronauts, they tended to be fighter pilots um, uh, with that sort of training. Um, we then through went through a phase where, you know, if you're having, a, if you're an, um, creating uh, a space flight, right, and you're choosing your astronauts and you only have five astronauts or four astronauts, whatever that number may be to fit in your spacecraft, because you need to provide them with um, oxygen and food and uh, waste, all of these kind of things need to be accounted for. You wanna take as little people as possible. And so if you have a doctor who's also an engineer, that's your astronaut that you're choosing. You're not gonna choose a doctor and an engineer. You're gonna find someone that has both those skill sets. Um, I think in the future, it will go back to, you know, when we have a lot more humans flying in space and you gotta, you gotta remember that there's not a lot of people that are 
actually uh, flying to space. There's, there's more, more than ever, right, with the commercial space programs, Blue Origin and the rest of them, SpaceX, et cetera. Axiom just launched, um, launching, you know, uh, astronauts into space um, and space tourists into space. This is becoming a lot more common, um, especially by the time you guys are, you know, in your 40s or 50s. Um, but at the moment, yeah, every mission has someone that's medically knowledgeable. Um, everybody, every astronaut generally goes through um, survival training. Um, some of the survival training is even the, um, what happens if there's, if um, the space, uh, you're coming back to earth and you don't land exactly where you're supposed to land. Um, you're right, you're not landing in the ocean, something like that. There's a bunch of things, they cover every base they can. Every problem that they can possibly think of, they try and solve before they experience it. So yeah, um, uh, if you are really wanting to be an astronaut, 10 years ago, I would have said, yeah, be, be a doctor and an engineer at the same time. Um, Angela, what's Angela say, Nicole? Angela would like to know, for the puffy face issue, would allergy medicine help relieve some of the fluids? Yeah, you, there's a lot of um, nasal breathable uh, steroids, right? If you've ever had a really bad sinus infection, um, there, you know, there's prescription and non-prescription like nasal sprays that you can spray up your nose and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to provide you with some temporary relief, but it's not going to solve the problem, which is all of this fluid doesn't, it's not being pushed downwards, right? It's not being pulled down to your toes as you're standing up because there's no gravity um, or very little gravity. So um, that kind of thing, I actually, it's a really good question. I'm not 100% sure. Angela, I bet money that, I wonder if anyone's ever tried it to at least get over the taste issue, right? Because you're floating in space, you need to maintain your, bo your body mass. You're, no one's, unless you're a space tourist, is up there just to have a good time. They're doing serious work. Research is being done. And if you're um, not hungry and not feel, not wanting to eat because you're not having, your taste sensations are reduced, um, I, would, I would wonder. I would wonder if that would at least give you temporary, um, temporary relief. Um, Angela, you're going to go to Google and ask your best friend Google that question um, or ChatGPT. Also, you got to, you know, as with anything, right, ChatGPT, Google, all of those, you need to, you know, decide whether what you're reading makes sense or not. Um, but um, as I am constantly telling my students, you have the knowledge of mankind on a device in front of you. I wish I had have had that when I was like 14, 15, 16, 21, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, make the most of that. Occasionally, um, I have a lot of students, Nicole, that are always saying, oh, don't look at Wikipedia, um, right? Wikipedia is sometimes, sometimes these Wikipedia pages are really good because not many people troll the Venus atmosphere Wikipedia page, right? It's not, it's just not what people are, um, tend to do. So as long as you are looking at the information that you're seeing on the web um, and deciding whether that makes sense and following up on their references and looking, um, looking at many uh, data sources, um, then I think you, yeah, look it up. Um, Angela, this would be a really cool um, uh, science competition topic right uh, like uh, yeah i tell my students the of the same thing about wikipedia check the references at the bottom see if they're legitimate yeah. references yeah because you're right not people aren't trolling the mars you know no. sites yeah i had a student the other day and they were like i was like oh the ganymede um which is my favorite moon in the entire solar system the ganymede wikipedia page we shouldn't trust that and i'm like no one trolls the ganymede yeah, wikipedia. Nobody, most people who are trolling don't even know what ganymede is yes exactly <laughs> that's the joy of planetary science this is the joy um, david I, wants to know um in the future if people will live on mars full time what would happen with their muscles and bones if they would never come back to earth they would have to exercise daily or their bodies would get used to it question mark like get used to the gravity of mars yeah that's a really good question david i'm super into science fiction there's a great science fiction movie about this where um someone is born on mars and sneaks back to the earth um 
always check with your parents to see whether your parents say you think that's an appropriate movie for you or not. But um, yes, uh, the good thing about Mars is it's not, the gravity on Mars is what a third of what it is on Earth, but it's a lot better than it is um, the just orbiting around the Earth on the space station or, um, you know, as you are flying from the Earth to Mars. So at least it's a third, at least it's not, you know, a much smaller number. But yes, those astronauts will need to maintain um, uh, there'll be a daily exercise component um, involved for sure. And there would also be osteoporosis kind of medications for sure too. Um, just the, the research, the research currently shows us that just say me, Nicole, Angela and James move to Mars. Just say we've solved just as a, as a experiment, let's just pretend that um, we fixed the problems. We've got a great habitat going. Me, Nicole, Angela and James are moving to Mars um, uh, and we stay there for a couple of years. Our bodies will not be the same when we come back to Earth. Um, because our bodies will do what every life form has done in the history of history, and that is it will evolve to its environment. It will, you know, um, change to um, suit its environment. If it doesn't do that, it dies, um, right? So, so, yeah, so me, Nicole, and Angela and James would come back with very different shapes bodies. We would be longer. We would have more gaps between um, uh, the discs of our spine. Um, yeah. Uh, it'd be really cool. Maybe I'd actually get to six foot. I was always really sad that I'd only made it to five foot 10. Um, maybe I'd be six foot. Um, but yeah, this, it's not just the shape and the height of us, right? It's what happens to our lungs and our kidneys and our, um, and our heart and our brain. So yeah, there is a lot of um, research um, that needs to be done. No, I don't want to be the first. Person. And there's, and there's a new reality show called stars on Mars and they oh, actually are they're doing a good job of addressing these things and the challenges they have are really pretty good for a reality show. Oh, really? I, just, I, I, I saw it. I saw an ad for it and I was like, oh, that looks really cool. Plus they got the greatest host of all, of all time, right? Exactly. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> it okay. is it's good. I, I'm enjoying it. A lot of athletes on there. Okay. Um, Henshin wants to know, can I rotate the crew compartment to travel um gravity Absolutely. unlike a large space station would it be easier to implement will this lateral rotation make astronauts dizzy uh, uh, i apologize if i mispronounced your name um this is um uh this is a, a really great question um and it goes back to so many once again awesome science fiction movies um where you're able to uh simulate a kind of a normal gravity for us based on a rotational um device um nasa doesn't have a plan for that um i have not seen the plans for orbital reef or any of the other space stations um that is the way that you would expect it to go, but currently um, the technology is not there. Although the physics um, does make sense. If you're in high school, please take physics as the greatest subject that you can ever take. Um, but uh, would this lateral rotate, rotation make the uh, astronauts dizzy? Um, technically, if that thing is rotating and you have this, um, and there's a technical term for it that they use in sci-fi books that I cannot remember right now, um, that would not make you dizzy, although you would think the change from going from a very low microgravity environment to something where you have normal gravity suddenly will make your human brain be like, what's going on? I feel nauseous. Um, but um, yeah, go, go look it up. These are things that are um, fascinating. Also, go look, look up space elevators. Those things are really interesting too. Um, not necessarily technologically uh, possible right at this very moment, but the physics of it is fascinating and you'll love it. Um, Nicole. Um, David would like to know, I know this is off topic, but what is your favorite space related movie? David, that is never off topic. Um, <laughs> science fiction movies um, will get you through a physics degree. Um, even in the toughest times of your planetary science PhD, science fiction movies will get you through anything I have learned over my 49 years. Um, I love so many things. Um, I really like, um, there's a book called Seven Eves that I absolutely loved. Um, 
I do love the classics like, you know, Space Odyssey, 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, Kalel, you've been my student for two years. I'm sure you've heard me rabbit on about God knows how many movies. I love Contact. Contact is mandatory watching. I make it, um, I set it as homework in every class that I teach. Um, my favorite movie. It's, it's just so good. Um, so good. It's so good. Um, Carl Sagan was the original planetary scientist turned science communicator, like the original Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, and it, he wrote he wrote Contact, he wrote the book, and the, the movie turned out really great too. Um, oh, God, I have so many. I have so many. Kalel, can you remind me of all my others? Because they're really... Interstellar, I, Martian. Uh, I, li I really like the Martian. I loved um, Greenland. Greenland is, I'm pretty sure, rated R. So you want to check with your parents because there is a violent scene in there with, with a hammer that is not good. But I absolutely love asteroid disaster movies. So, yes. Angela said, apparently they used a nasal emollient in every medical space kit in the Apollo missions to help our uh, astronauts with allergy issues. See, so look what you just did. You just used the knowledge of mankind to solve your own problem. Like, and you taught me something. This is, yeah, awesome. I didn't know that either. I do want to say, I do want to say to the student who asked about rotating um, yeah. the travel, you can implement that on your project because this project is for you students to figure out how you want to travel to Mars. Um, you do not have to spend a lot of time on the way to get there because it is just assumed that you get to Mars and safely in whatever way, but certainly you may research that and add that into your project. Excellent. Yeah, I love that. These kind of projects um, are kind of, kind of, they can be life-changing, right? These are the kind yes. of projects can, that can make you go, Hey, I really like this stuff and I'm, you know, I'm really interested. And when you find that thing that you're really into, um, it's a really great feeling. When I, the, what changed my life was the 25th anniversary Star Trek special. I watched that, I guess, 1990 or something. And I thought and there was all these scientists and astronomers on there. And it never occurred to me that I could do that for a job. And that's when I was in undergrad. And I'm like, I registered for every astronomy class I could after that. And it just took me by storm. Just yeah. took me by storm. I didn't know you could do it for a job. It just didn't. I didn't know that. I did not know that either. I grew up on a very uh, small kind of sheep farm in Australia. Um, I didn't, uh, you hear that phrase, see it to be it. Like I didn't see it. It wasn't around me. Correct. Um, Same. And yep. it's these kind of things can be really life changing. So, so I love that you're doing these projects. I think it's really, really cool. Pal, did you want to um, say something? You were going to, you unmuted you yourself. Say my movie. No, I was always going to say that you liked Star Trek more than Star Wars. Oh, I like, was... yeah, everyone knows that Star. Although, Kalel, I will have to tell you that my friend, um, my friend Jim Green got me onto The Mandalorian recently, and I don't like Star Wars, but I love The Mandalorian. So um, good. So, I, it's not that Now, you got to watch The Boba Fett Show, because so... I can't tell you why, but watch it. It's also okay. on Disney+. Plus. Excellent. Okay, for a um, moment, I almost, I almost thought uh, you said Jim Green got you on The Mandalorian, like, like. No, wouldn't that be cool? Oh something. my god! But then so I realized, good. then I realized, no, he just like, like you know, now I you're watching. I don't yeah. know if Jim Green has that sort of power, Kalel. 